Welcome to anybody. As the chair of the Department of Sociology, it's a great pleasure to greet Professor Bauman for his lecture today. And I wish to thank my colleague Vincent de la Sala and our visiting professor Piotr Dukiewicz for having organized that. And of course, Gianfranco Poggi for having accepted to comment. There is nothing like waiting for something and not getting it, so I will be very, very short. Professor, I don't think Professor Bauman needs an introduction. All of you probably know a lot about him. So probably the best stuff is just going straight to the real thing. Bye, and thanks for anybody. Um, um. Grazie uh, a Giuseppe per il benvenuto, uh, anche io voglio dare il benvenuto al professore Bauman, um, a Gianfranco Poggi, anche io voglio ringraziarlo per aver accettato di fare parte uh, di, questa, di questa conferenza, e al, uh, al vecchio collega, perché eravamo colleghi in Canada, Piotr Dukevic, uh, per, uh, anche lui per aver fatto parte di questa di questa conferenza. Voglio anche ringraziare Marco Brunazzo, il centro Jean Monnet, che ha organizzato uh, questo evento, uh, intellettualmente anche dal punto di vista organizzativo. E più di, più di tutto voglio ringraziare il professor Bauman per aver accettato. E dirò due parole un po' dal contesto in cui esce questo libro, questo evento, e, e poi di introdurre il collega, eh, l'amico Piotr Tukevic, uh, e poi uh, avremo il professor Bauman. Eh, uh, questa conferenza emerge da questo libro, 22 Ideas to Fix the World. Um, è un libro da una parte pazzesco, frutto dell'ambizione e della visione del, di Piotr Dukevic, che ha, ha messo insieme con Richard Sacqua 22 prominenti pensatori per dire qualcosa su dove va il mondo e come ripararlo. E ci sono più di 22 idee, purtroppo ci sono più di 22 problemi da aggiustare, e, ma il, il libro, è, come tutti i libri, sono, è importante, ma è, arriva a un momento abbastanza importante nella nostra storia, l'interregnum di cui ci parlerà il professor Bauman. E, voglio dire due cose sul libro, e, e, dirò in inglese, che, um, che mi, hanno, mi ha colpito del libro. Um, the first thing that is striking about the book is the question that um, the word crisis, we all talk about crisis, we use it all the time, we abuse the term, and what is interesting in this book is that um, how we understand the crisis Um, what we think the crisis is, is varies. Some people say it's a, it's a technical problem. And some people, there's solutions in terms of financial regulations. Others say this is a crisis of modernity. Um, and clearly, the idea to fix the world changes depending on how we define the problem. The second thing that's striking about this book is You cannot read this book and be struck by the distance between what uh, 22 eminent thinkers uh, are saying is the problem and the solutions and what political leadership across the globe today is putting on the political agenda. Uh, it is like we are talking about two parallel universes. And what emerges, I think, from the book from some of the interventions in the book, is that we have fundamentally a political crisis, a political crisis of ideas, of vision. And uh, the thinkers in this book certainly are giving us ideas and visions. And for that reason alone, I think it's well worth reading. The last thing I'd like to do is to introduce um, 
uh, one of the, the, the forces behind this book, Piotr Dukevich, uh, as Professor Shortino mentioned, uh, Professor Dukevich is a visiting research fellow here at the University of Trento for the next uh, three years. Uh, Piotr um, uh, is an expert on many things. If you look at his CV, started his career as an expert on African development, uh, but today he is probably um, best known for being an expert on Russia, democracy, and modernization. Um, in addition to uh, being an architect to find ideas to fix the world. Um, so I would like to welcome Piat and uh, thank him once again for coming to Trento. It's indeed a great honor and pleasure. Uh, good afternoon, buonasera, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honor, pleasure, privilege to be uh, in, such a, in such a university with this audience. And we are here to celebrate uh, our guest of honor, uh, the wise man, uh, the person who is well known in Italy and I think loved in Italy, more than known, loved in Italy, Professor Bauman. But uh, I would like to say uh, just, uh, just uh, three, uh, three or four long sentences. This book uh, is a dialogue about ideas. Uh, it's a dialogue about ideas that we, that we all uh, cherish. This book is about the environment, about the social structure, about the financialization of the world, about the crisis of the banking system, and so on and so forth. Any, meaning, any meaningful dialogue is about equals. That's why this book is constructed in a very specific way. It's not an interview with the experts. There are experts talking to each other. <laughs> Any meaningful dialogue, it's uh, about the uh, diversity. And that's why this book also uh, shows the diverse intellectual traditions from left to right and center. A meaningful dialogue is about the different cultures. And that's why this book represents different or experts and authors from different regions. Latin America represented, North America, Europe, Russia, Asia. <laughs> uh, and by this book, we're trying to, to answer the key question uh, to, to many people like myself, uh, who after the crisis 2008, 2010, ask uh, ourselves, why there is such a meaningless response to the crisis. Each big crisis created big ideas. Keynes, Friedman created Roosevelt and Thatcher. <laughs> why, why the last crisis didn't create the similar change of paradigm towards uh, the market? <laughs> And it didn't. So my question was, like many of my colleagues, why? <clears throat> and the, the second answer was, and the second question was whether we do not have simply ideas, or the ideas that are exist, they are ignored, uh, ridiculed, uh, maybe sidelined. <clears throat> so this was my hypothesis, where we started with Richard Sakfa to uh, to uh, to ask people to participate in this volume. And uh, as a result, we, uh, we came up with the conclusion, there are ideas. You will hear today from Professor Bauman, one of those prominent people who will tell you what his ideas are. <laughs> and there are many of them, 22 ideas. And, uh, and I hope that by the, by the lecture of Professor Bauman, you will start read this book. Uh, read this book in the spirit of tolerance and understanding. This book is not left or right. It's not the center. This book is a dialogue among cultures and among different intellectual traditions. And I will, uh, and I will be very pleased if some of, some of you, after this lecture, will go to the library and pick it up for a few minutes. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Um, I'd also uh, want to add that, and most importantly, um, well, not most importantly, but the book is also the fruit of um, 
uh, a dialogue of civilizations, um, which is the World Public Forum, um, an organization that is committed to, uh, to dialogue, as Piot said, uh, on civilizational questions about the environment, about how we govern uh, globalization, uh, and so on. Uh, the World Public Forum has met uh, for the past 11 years um, and has produced, uh, in addition to this volume, a, a four-volume series on the global financial crisis, also with New York University Press, um, with, again, with uh, leading experts. Um, uh, the event today is also a way for us to announce that the World Public Forum um, will, in the next few months, be opening a research center here in Trento, um, where we hope um, uh, to continue and to use Trento's uh, reputation, Trento's uh, position uh, at the crossroads of Northern and Southern Europe, East and West, uh, also to continue uh, dialogue. And over the next few months, you will hear more information on that. Uh, for Matt, now it, um, I would like to introduce Gianfranco Poggi, who does not need an introduction here in Trento, um, who will um, say uh, something about uh, Professor Bauman. Gianfranco, thank you. Now, I'm not going to, so foolish, to be so foolish and to entertain a dialogue on the substance of the book itself, which I am not very familiar with anyway, or even with the contribution by Zygmunt Bauman, which I've had the chance to look at. These things are too big for me. So I, will, I decided to adopt a more um, friendly, if you want, or a lesser approach, which I've seen in various occasions. There's an important speaker, and you talk about the speaker and myself. The trouble with that is very often, I've seen it happen in volumes too, it suddenly becomes myself and the speaker. And that is something I want to avoid because it would be a lot more boring to hear about myself than it would be about Bauman. So I will try to concentrate my remarks, although they are occasioned by previous encounters and a certain degree of, of uh, familiarity, I will try to stay in the background and uh, talk more about Bauman himself, sort of referring to occasions I've had or conferring with him or meeting or whatever. Let's begin with some date in 19, the 1970s, when I, I think it was, which I cannot remember. Um, I suddenly, I was a teaching sociology at the University of Edinburgh at the time, and got an invitation to take part in a, a strange uh, ceremony, or a strange arrangement in Leeds University. This was signed by Bauman, I knew the name, and I gladly accepted. Now, Bauman had had an interesting idea. I don't know whether they would do that every term, but occasionally the teaching stopped. And you created a series of encounters between professionals, between the professors or the teachers themselves in the university, inviting also other people from outside. Because you wanted to convince the students of something they find difficult to imagine, that teachers can also talk to one another and learn from one another and controvert with one another. So you would, form, I don't know many times he was able to do that, but he would formulate an interesting, provocative topic and uh, ask, as I said, for a suspension of lectures, come together and then dialogue, which often meant, of course, quarrel with one another, uh, both, as I said, from the local teachers and people invited from outside. So I accepted the invitation, I, I knew about his name, and I went there and I gave a presentation on some contributions, some relationship between Gramsci's thought and, uh, and sociology. That was probably unfortunate. I didn't know that um, uh, Gramsci was an author that Bauman himself was very familiar with. I thought I was bringing something fresh, but by Lord, I mean, the man knew a lot more about Gramsci than I did. And he confirmed that later on when he sent me a copy of the Italian edition of a book of his, which was called Lineamenti di una sociologia marxista. This was published in 1971 by Editori Runiti. I had not heard about it. I found it very interesting. I even asked him whether he was going to produce an English edition of it. But there were various complications of a sort of juridical nature about doing that. Anyway, this was an example of the particularly fresh and innovative approach of Bauman to the academic business, to the intellectual business, to the management of a department. Now, how, if you want, we can now look back. How did Bauman get to Leeds? Well, it's a complicated story. 
But he came to Leeds, uh, when he came to Leeds, he had been a professor of sociology at Tel Aviv University. And apparently, the idea was that somebody at Leeds had had an idea. We can turn Leeds, Leeds always had a sociology department. We can turn the sociology department into a major world center of sociological research and sociological theory. And by golly, they found the right man to do that for them. And so far, I already understand that um, uh, Bauman was easily persuaded there would be funding for doing this in a big way, and he would really put Leeds on the map. Well, unfortunately, by the time he got to Leeds, as the story goes, it may not be true, they, in England was going through the typical stop-go cycle, and the money he expected wasn't there. But very manfully, Bauman decided to uh, you know, take on the department anyway. He, he invited, he had some very interesting callings, including a number of young ones, and uh, so Leeds became a very respectable center of sociological learning, although the idea of using Leeds to challenge Columbia or challenge Berkeley or challenge Harvard was simply underfunded, and that didn't happen. But he was very good about it. He did not um, you know, protest about this. He just uh, made the most of it. So uh, as I said, this was a matter of confirming the presence of sociology in a big way at Leeds and, and making it a very significant component of the sociology scene in England. I'm saying England because since I taught at Edinburgh, I wasn't supposed to take this too seriously. Things south of the, of the, of the border are not really, you, can't, you shouldn't make too much of it, but I was flattered and I was able to be able to make a contribution. I think the next time I had an opportunity to speak personally, there were being conferences or other minor occasions to meet with uh, Bauman was at Bristol. We both examined together a PhD thesis. I'm afraid I forgot that talk. Uh, I can't remember who was doing. All I remember is was a Protestant pastor, a qualified Protestant Geistliche, as they say in German, who had decided to take a sociology degree and go into the sociology profession. He did a very good job of it. I think Zygmunt and I we're aware of that, of that, but then he disappeared to Australia, and I'm afraid I didn't know what happened after that. After that, for a number of, of years, we had a kind of exchange between Bowen and myself, a very asymmetric exchange, okay? He was, the volume and the value and the significance of his production was incomparably greater than anything I could contribute, but he was good enough occasionally to send me comments. I think he also may have written a review at some point or something I wrote. And then uh, this led later on, there was, one of, the, of Bauman's students at Leeds took the initiative of producing what the Germans called the Festschrift, a volume of uh, pieces, written writings, written on the occasion of, you know, to celebrate somebody and to lend homage to his achievements. So uh, the, what, the thing I contributed was a, an article or an essay or a paper, call it as you will, on similar modern society. But as I said, this was a very asymmetric exchange because uh, through those years and, and, and later, and including these very days, Bauman continued to demonstrate a unique combination of talents. First of all, a huge amount of knowledge in various scholarly fields, in various languages, uh, which he, you know, he had accumulated over the years and he could mani well, manipulate is the wrong expression. He could use, if you want, to advance his own argument. Also a gift for literate exposition, which made him, of course, very welcome as a person addressing the general public very successfully about things of, of major significance. I think I've heard him once, but this is things I would like to say to try to embarrass him, that his ambition was to become the Conrad of sociology. As you know, Conrad was a Polish writer and he became one of the greatest uh, novelists in, in English. His English was very sophisticated and exemplary, and I think he was doing a similar job of that. All this without leaving the vocation of a sociologist, which also entails a lot of empirical work, research work, library work, or whatever, which in a sense uh, is represented, I, I don't know, one could argue whether there are better examples of this, in the book about the relationship between the Holocaust and modernity, which was, uh, among other things, the product of a sustained and imaginative confrontation with the data. But essentially, from a certain point on, Bauman went into orbit. And all I could do was sit back and take notice and read. I'm afraid I may not have read all the books, but certainly take notice of the importance of his production and become a witness of his um, unequal capacity for blending um, scholarly 
scholarly background, scholarly, scholarly knowledge with a great capacity for intuition, capturing um, ways, imaginative, unique, innovative ways of, um, of prospecting, if you want, the modern world, the contemporary events. This, of course, became focused at a certain point around the image, very imaginative image of liquidity, which he was able to apply to a number of different fields very impressively, and this becomes a kind of identifying marker of his, of his thinking. Another thing one might say, but I'm about to finish here, that um, this entailed, of course, this work, which was a sustained confrontation with the problematic of the contemporary world and in entering in the discussion about modernity, postmodernity, etc. To some extent, this entailed uh, Bauman detaching himself from some of his uh, scholarly roots. I remember he once told me, you know, there was a time when he, people woke me up at three o'clock and told me, what do you think of this? I was able immediately to project uh, an understanding and give a little speech or presentation about what I can't do that anymore. There were too many things happening in the world which needed reflection, which needed loosening oneself from uh, previous scholarly heritage heritages and uh, thereby make, of course, a sustained, invaluable contribution which has uh, obtained uh, um, very wide recognition. The final opportunity to embarrass Bauman is by reporting something that happened, I can't remember how many years ago, perhaps a little less than 10, visiting with him at, at Leeds and noticing in his house, among other things, a collection of beautiful photos hanging from the walls. And uh, Bauman explained to me that those were his photos. He had, um, he had developed a, a, a skill, sophisticated skill, also in photography, and he had actually won a photography prize. And he told me a, a story about that. He said, you know what I did was, as a sociologist, study and ask myself what kinds of photos get, get photography prizes. Once he had learned that, he got his, his, his prize for, for photography. That's another minor achievement where I wanted to add this little contribution to your, not the knowledge you have or the knowledge you're going to form about Zygmunt Bauman. Thank you. Um, thank you, Gianfranco. And um, I have nothing left to introduce but uh, Professor Bauman, who will speak about living in times of interregnum. Please, Professor Bauman. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we are here not in order to speak about Baumana, but to welcome the great book which has been published uh, thanks to Professor Tskevich, Professor Sakva, Professor De La Sala. Uh, the book which uh, says two different things. One, insists on the fact that the world needs fixing, that there is something essentially wrong with the way we live. And then, second thing, it suggests all sorts of things which could be done, which need to be done, which must be done in order to uh, fix the, uh, well, the shortcomings, the inabilities, inanities of the world we live in. I don't know why the uh, editors, initiators and editors and executors of this collection selected me to um, speak to the contents of the book. The, I uh, had a copy of it only one, less than one day, but I already managed to find quite a few contributions which are uh, much more profound uh, uh, profound and far-reaching and uh, urgent, in fact, than uh, my uh, contribution to the book. I think the uh, book will be much more uh, important to you than to me, uh, for simple reason. I am very old man. I won't be here a, a very long time, uh, uh, but you have the whole life in front. And uh, this book you can treat as an inventory of issues with which you have to cope, 
one way or the other. And the results will depend on the decisions you made, how to, how to tackle the issues which are discussed there. I would, uh, let me start uh, from quotation from a very wise man and a very wonderful writer, uh, J.M. Kutze, the South African writer, whom I personally consider to be the best novelist, living novelist among philosophers, and the best philosopher, living philosopher among novelists. And a uh, book quotation I would like to uh, read uh, is from his uh, recent diary, which he called Diary of a Bad Year. Uh, he selected this bad year, the year 2011. And what he said there, among other things, is the following. Uh, he raised the question of why life must be likened to a race, or of why the national economies must race against one another, one another rather than going for a comradely jog together for the sake of the health. Um, such question is not raised. And he adds, but surely God did not make the market, God or the spirit of history. And if we human beings made it, can we not unmake it and remake it in a kind, kindlier form? Why does the world have to be a kill or be killed, gladiatorial amphitheater, rather than, say, a busily cooperative beehive or anthill. Really a big question. Because what, are, what is the necessity? Necessity is the sediment of our past decisions. And the decisions which are making now lay the foundation foundations for the necessities of tomorrow. Let us be quite clear about our responsibility for the state of the world, and let us be uh, aware of the gravity and immense consequences of how we live our own life, how enormous influence it will have for what your grandfather children and great-grandchildren will call the necessity, the reality, the uh, order of things, and so on. That is, the, in this spirit, I would like to present to you the issue of interregnum, Plato de la Sala already mentioned, that is the topic of my uh, presentation today. Interregnum, where from it comes? As far as I can say, it uh, appeared for the first time in Tito Livio, History of Rome, uh, from Foundation of the City. Um, he described there the rule of the first legendary king of Rome, um, Romulus. Romulus, according to him, lived for 38 years. Uh, not, sorry, not lived, ruled ruled Rome for 38 years. And 38 years, my dear friends, at that time was the average length of life of the average person. Which means that the moment Romulus uh, died, or as uh, uh, Tito Livio uh, suggests, uh, well, was raised to heaven, simply disappeared instead of dying. There's no grave of Romulus to be found anywhere. Uh, now, um, when he died, there were, very, there were very few people in Rome who remembered a world which did not contain Romulus. That was the first interregnum, the time of panic, of completely decomposition of life of complete uncertainty. People were used to the idea that uh, whatever needs to be done and how people need to live comes from Romulus. He will tell you what uh, the edicts coming from his palace uh, settle the 
state of affairs, state of things, and all the recommendations which are needed. Antonio Gramsci, whom uh, both speakers already mentioned, uh, picked up on this concept. And, uh, uh, he gave uh, the concept uh, at the updated meeting. Meeting going beyond simply the change of king. The period uh, which uh, uh, um, uh, existed in ancient Rome between disappearance of Romulus and the appointment of Nuba as the next king of Rome. Uh, the indefinition of Gramsci, which I follow simply, the uh, interregnum is a situation in which the old ways of doing things don't work, work any longer, but the new ways of doing things has not been yet designed and put in place. If that is the case, then there are three um, aspects of living in the world of interregnum, uh, in the era of interregnum. First of all, we are haunted by our ignorance. We don't know how to, what to do, how to do it. Uh, the uh, book which we are welcoming today, 22 Ideas to Fix the World, is one of the expressions of the many, many uh, di disparate, diffuse, uh, discoordinated very often ideas which simply manifest our the lack of self-confidence, our lack of uh, um, uh, belief, trust in the, in the uh, knowledge we already possess how to do things. Ignorance. Uh, the other aspect very closely related to ignorance is the feeling of impotence, that we don't know how to do it, how to go about it, who is going to do it, things like that. Uh, even if we had 100% volume of the knowledge required to change the world and uh, save the world and improve our, make it more hospitable to humanity, uh, we would not be able to put that in life, our ideas. The third aspect, and uh, probably the most painful in the uh, last respect, is the loss of self-confidence and uh, the feeling of humiliation. We are inadequate. Uh, whatever we do doesn't have much consequence. Nothing happens. We are trying this and that. Um, sometimes we are straining ourselves. Sometimes we are uh, coming close to very great self-sacrifice, but nothing really happens. We are not up to the task which is confronting us. Once you believe that, then you stop acting, then you stop thinking, which means that we are in a sort of a vicious circle in the times of interregnum. Um, we exacerbate all the uh, things which make us ineffective in shaping our joint future. I suggest to you, ladies and gentlemen, that our present crisis is not so much a crisis of ideas. Ideas are abundant. I am afraid, I would say even, whenever I you know, ask Google about something, I have several billions of answers, so really ideas are very, very prolific. Uh, the, the trouble actually is not so much the uh, uh, dares of ideas as, uh, as the excess of ideas which are bombarding us and between which is different to, difficult to select. What is really the, uh, the dangerous crisis is the crisis of agency. When I was a young person, uh, my generation, I remember, was quarreling about uh, uh, what is to be done. We were short of good ideas. We looked for those ideas. Today, uh, as I said, there is no dearth of ideas any longer. Uh, what is happening, actually, is the dearth of agencies. The, the question is not so much what is to be done, 
we can discuss the matter and come to some conclusion on this topic. The, the problem is today, who is going to do it? Um, well, there was, a, there was a period of interregnum when Gramsci wrote about it. He wrote it from prison, from fascist prison, as you know. And um, that was the late 20s uh, time, uh, late 20s, beginning of 30s, when he wrote his um, uh, um, copy books from prison. And uh, uh, the tremendous crisis, collapse of society after the First World War, massive unemployment, massive inflation, uh, just things falling apart. What was the difference between that crisis in our crisis of 2007, of collapse of credit in our own times, which we still remember, and the consequences of which we feel? The difference then was that people in 1920s and 1930s do who is going to improve the state of affairs. Who is going to do it? Of course the government, the state. The state is all powerful. They believe in the state. They believe in the state. They, of course, uh, compose different programs, but all programs were directed to the same place. If only we win the next election, if only we will take power, if only we will occupy the governmental offices, the program will be implemented. The state has the ability to shape the state of affairs. Then there was another period of interregnum, uh, late 1970s, uh, 1980s. Um, well, the, um, uh, I have no time to discuss it in detail, but roughly what has happened then, um, unemployment in, 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 in spite of uh, active role of the state in preventing it was again on the rise. Inflation was again, again going up. Uh, and uh, uh, efficiency of production was falling down. So clearly, the things as they were done in uh, 1950s, 1960s, 1970s could not be done in the same way any longer. Um, again, some sort of a crisis of agency, but again, big difference with our own crisis. Uh, simply because in 1970s, people believed you who will do the job. In the visible hand of the market, market will do the job. State bureaucrats couldn't do it, but market, which will replace it with it in its infinite wisdom, will accomplish the task. Ladies and gentlemen, when struck the last uh, crisis, the credit crisis, when the uh, 30 years long uh, uh, consumerist orgy uh, conducted uh, uh, by spending non-earned money and uh, throwing in debt our, our, our children and our grandchildren, now, after that ended, differs from those two interregnum periods by the fact that there is no savior, no savior in view. We don't trust state any longer in its capacity to improve things, and we don't trust the wisdom or the invisible hand of the market. So, who is going to do it? I suggest to you that it, this interregnum today, which we are going through today, is deeper and more serious and less, uh, more prospectless, more prospectless than those which our ancestors experienced. That puts us in really very difficult predicament. Just a few thoughts how it, how it came to it, how it happened, how it happened. Well, uh, in the nutshell, I would say that the reason of the uh, present 
interregnum period is the divorce between power and politics. Power is means ability to have things done. And politics is ability to decide which things ought to be done. Now these two capacities both equally necessary for having things done, for being effective, for accomplishing a change in society, were united, married to each other, were united since approximately 1555. What happened in 1555? Well, there was a long period of religious wars before Europe was almost devastated. According to contemporary uh, calculations, about 30 to 50 percent of the population of uh, the western part of Europe, at least, was killed, was murdered, disappeared in the result of direct combat in the war, massacres which are bare associated with it, and the epidemies which followed it. And uh, in 1555, representatives of the ruling dynasties of uh, Europe engaged in this um, reformation, counter-reformation religious wars, came together in order to design a formula which will finally bring a, uh, put an end to this disaster which was developing our continent. And they found the formula. And formula is still with us, and you probably heard about it many times. It was the formula cuius regio eius religio. Cuius regio eius religio. Who rules has the right to decide in what God his subjects ought to believe? To put it in, in, in the essence, that is the meaning of Cuius Regio Eius Religio. But, ladies and gentlemen, uh, inadvertently, secondarily, derivatively, that was not only the formula regulating, regulating. Uh, the uh, relationship between different versions of Christianity. It was also, and very importantly, it had tremendous consequences, a formula establishing the principle of territorial, absolute, undivided sovereignty of the ruler. Territorial sovereignty. And at the same time, by the same token, the prohibition for everybody else outside the boundaries, territorial boundaries of the state, to interfere with what is going on, what is happening inside these boundaries. The principle of territorial sovereignty. Well, it took almost 100 years of uh, internecine struggle on the many, many battlefields of Europe for this formula actually to take roots. Uh, the first meeting was in Augsburg in 1648. Another meeting took place, this time in Münster and Osnabrück, two other German cities, where again representatives of uh, the ruling dynasties came to debate and then there, then and there, then agreed to follow this principle. They had above their ears they have more than enough of the disasters which piled up uh, in 200 years almost of European history. Uh, since then, in a way probably unanticipated by the participants of the debate in Osnabrück, Minster, uh, Augsburg, uh, this formula uh, started to guide the process which was essential to the establishment of modern society, namely 
the process of the nation building, of the nation building, modern nation building, modern nation building, which uh, was combined all along with the modern state building. Nation and state uh, needed each other tre uh, tremendously. They couldn't live with each other. The state, uh, the nation needed the state to establish its right to sovereignty over the territory occupied by very many different ethnic groups, different languages, different, uh, different um, historical memories. The modern nation should be created as a unity, and for doing just that, it needed the um, coerc coercive powers of the state. Otherwise, it wouldn't happen. And the state needed nation as, a, as its legitimation. The fact that the, what state is requiring from its citizens is justified. This claim was based, rested on the uh, idea that the state is representing the interest of the nation, the mission of the nation, the prospect of the nation, that it is all for the national good. Both agents needed each other and couldn't live with each, without each other. And to achieve this situation, a very simple operation was needed. In the formula cuius regio eius religio, you should uh, change only one word and say, cuius regio eius ratio. And that's exactly what happened. That is how modern Europe emerged, and that is how, and that is why, there were two world wars, which were not world wars, they were wars between Europeans staged on the global scene. But they were wars between Europeans. And uh, if some people say that uh, another world war is impossible, I agree. But uh, I think that it is precisely because Europeans don't fight each other any longer. They were behind all, uh, both two world wars which we, which we know. Um, then, uh, remember, uh, my dear friends, Europe at some point being at the time when it was the only part of the globe which really modernized and therefore developed uh, its own military and economic superiority over the rest of the globe, Europe um, expanded. And while expanding in its colonialist policy, imperialist policy, it also took, it also took uh, idea of the sovereign, territorially sovereign nation state as the basic rule to organize the human cohabitation. They took it with themselves. Uh, look, uh, most of the uh, uh, wild, savage wars which are uh, turning apart Africa today are caused by the fact that this idea was artificially implanted by, on territories, sometimes with uh, the help of drawing a straight line by over the of, over the map by two generals sitting uh, against each other at the table. Uh, now the imposed artificially on a land occupied by tribes, by tribes, uh, by pre-ethnic, pre-ethnos, uh, so, uh, so to speak, uh, clearly not prepared in this way in which Europe at some point was prepared to embark on the implementation of the ideal of the nation state. All right, but let's leave that aside. The question is that uh, the principle of, uh, of uh, territorial sovereignty uh, left uh, uh, trace behind, very important uh, trace. Well, uh, the uh, uh, 
a certain number of institutions, of institutions, political institutions, which served uh, trans tra transforming the idea of territorial sovereignty into reality, into, into state of affairs, into state of affairs idea of representative democracy, idea of tripartite separation of power, as you know, uh, many other things, Supreme Court, independent court among them, tremendously important. All that was invented in order to serve the uh, reality. A reality was the division of the globe between different territorially sovereign nation states. On assumption that still, as before, the state, territorially sovereign state, has both the power and political instrument to do the job. But this, ladies and gentlemen, is no longer the case. This is precisely what has changed. This is precisely why you look askance on your prime ministers, whoever they are. You haven't lost trust in any in one single uh, political party, but the whole party system. It does not deliver. It does not deliver. You don't believe that appealing to the government to implement this or that policy will have any effect. Because even if the politicians are very honest people, deeply moral people, not corrupt in any way, and not stupid in any way, they are simply missing the means to reach the goal. And not because of the process of globalization, which so far consists in one, in one thing only, mostly, it is a, a I call it uh, negative globalization, because what has happened is just sucking out, drawing out power from the territorial entities, uh, putting them in the no man's land, in the wild west of the, um, of the what uh, uh, Miguel, Miguel Castells, uh, uh, Spanish sociologist, called the space of flows, space of flows. Their powers, which have been derived, taken away from the state, powers of uh, trade, powers of investment, powers of control of capital, movement of capital, and things like that, they are now put beyond political control. <coughs> While the politics remained as local as it was 100 or 200 years ago. It is confined to one territorial nation state. However powerful the nation state is, however resourceful it is, it is quite painfully aware that it is not a full, in full control of its own country. It's not. When politicians make decisions, then well, they uh, wait nervously till Monday when the stock exchange is reopened, and then they will know whether their decisions have any chance of uh, being really set in place, or whether they made a blunder, a mistake. Our governments at the moment are in what can be only called taking the leave from psychologists uh, can, can be only called double bind, double bind. That means government of every territorial state is under pressure of two contradictory forces. It has to maneuver between them, it has to try to reconcile them, and it is a damn difficult uh, task to perform. Two forces. Well, you elect your government, so, they, so the governments depend on you. And therefore, they have to listen to you. If they don't listen to you, 
then they won't be elected again. They will lose power. That's one pressure. They have to listen to the electorate. And uh, listening to electorate, they probably will have even, they will have even to make promises, to make promises. But there is another pressure coming from outside, from these uh, powers which are not no longer in the hands of the state, um, which uh, push the government in opposite direction. If they really followed what the population want them to do, then uh, they could risk a tremendous trouble uh, in which uh, the country will fall. There is no easy exit from this situation when the problems confronted by our existing political institutions are globally produced but the ways of dealing with them are locally confined. We don't have, ladies and gentlemen, so far, anything on the global level which uh, uh, could be considered as an equivalent of the institutions which our ancestors invented and put in place for servicing territorial nation states. Power and politics remain in the state of divorce, simply because the two are not commensurate. Power, to a very great extent, is already global. Politics, to a very great extent, remains local. Which means that we are living between, on the one hand, power which is emancipated from political democratic control and on the other hand politics which suffers of the deficit of power. That is why we feel ignorant, that's why we feel impotent, that's why we feel humiliated. That is why I suggest that we should call the present crisis a crisis of agency or crisis or institutional crisis. We lack the institutions which could marry again sufficient power and adequate political apparatus. Well, I, th I think, ladies and gentlemen, who knows, but I'm, I'm not prophesizing, but I guess, I guess that um, uh, well, the rest of your life probably uh, will, uh, will be conducted as a sort of uh, marriage brokers. You have to remarry power and politics. Unless the both are uh, adequate to each other, not much will be, will be able to do to really, in a reasonable way, make the planet more hospitable uh, for uh, humanity. And mind you, there are, uh, there are uh, arising, growing problems, quite s profound problems, never before confronted, um, which need, uh, need, need speedy tackling. And there is no powerful and politically able institution able to do it. Precisely because the sources are global and the execution, the reaction to it is local. What problems? Just to give you uh, two examples of hand. One is the uh, ongoing uh, diasporization of the planet. Diasporization of the planet. Mass migration of the population which is globally produced. No one invites them in locality. They are coming because they are pushed from behind by the pressures of globalization. Of globalization of trade, globalization of the, of the, of the markets, and the, uh, the losing of their traditional way of making a living, um, which follows. 
they are globally produced, but they are thrown to the localities in order to dealt with, in a sort of a dustbin. The hospitalization global phenomenon, which is expected to be dealt with by global means. They could be only half-hearted, they will create a lot of local conflict and risk not coming anywhere near resolving the global problem of increasing production of redundant people, which stands behind the mass migration. It is redundant people in their own territorially sovereign places which are forced to be on the move uh, simply because uh, of becoming redundant. One problem. Second problem of CAF named is the problem of the climate change, but uh, uh, even more than that, it is the problem of sustainability of the planet. Sustainability of the planet. According to some trustworthy calculations, we are already consuming one and a half planet, which means that we are consuming 50% more natural resources which the planet is able to uh, offer us without becoming devastated. One and a half. But according to other uh, calculations, in the next 40 years, if we don't change anything in our way of life, our way of using the resources which uh, nature gave us, um, then in the 40 years uh, coming, we will need five planets to sustain our way of life, five planets. There are very little chance that uh, five planets will be found, four planets, sorry, one we already have for the time being, but four other planets uh, found uh, in 40 years' time. Um, you, you would say that uh, uh, it is also very unlikely that uh, in 40 years' time coming, you will find means of remarrying power and politics and uh, complement the negative globalization by the positive globalization taking the let loose forces under control of the democratically elected powers. Well, you may say that. To which I can only answer that unless you do that, that the other uh, prospect, prospect of, of waking up short of four more planets to survive uh, will become very much likely. Well, that's the uh, thought which I would like to leave you. Um, in the book, which is on this table, actually I see two copies, there are an enormous amount of very important ideas. Uh, perhaps, uh, fortunately, um, with more specific propositions, recipes, for their solutions. I, uh, unfortunately, am unable to offer you them. The only thing I, uh, I, uh, uh, I, can, I can tell you in the end is don't say that you haven't been warned. Abbiamo tempo per qualche domanda. We have time for some questions. So um, we can try and take a few very brief, um, molto, se possiamo essere breve, precisi. E, um, aspettiamo il microfono, ma e magari se avete domande.
non riesce a sentire sì parlare al microfono ah ok one two ah c'è il microfono c'è un microfono Buonasera. Allora, beh, mi ha colpito molto l'accostamento diciamo, tra la, la globalizzazione e poi quello che è il, la, la gestione locale poi delle, della politica e quindi con tutti i suoi contorni nazionali e locali. E noi qui in questo momento stiamo vivendo diciamo, qualcosa che va al di là dei confini nazionali e ne stiamo, diciamo, eh, forse in qualche modo sopportando le conseguenze nel bene e nel male che è stato quello dell'unione eh, economico-monetaria europea diciamo. e quindi non tanto un'unione politica ma un'unione di tipo eh, economica senza basi condivise di un popolo che comunque eh, quello europeo aveva una storia molto eh, come dire, lungimirante L'osservazione che volevo chiedere, cioè la domanda che volevo fare, scusate l'emozione, era al di là di questa premessa, era appunto, lei aveva parlato di scenari diciamo drammatici che ci saremmo svegliati una mattina con, con qualche cattiva sorpresa. Allora io ero un po' incuriosito da, siccome mi piace sapere, eh, e le sue come dire, osservazioni sono molto come dire, eh, ferrate in materia, volevo capire... Eh, Qual era uno scenario possibile di questa mattina in cui ci saremmo svegliati e cosa sarebbe potuto accadere? Grazie. Uh, well, I uh, left aside the question of Europe. I should do that really. I'm very keen to discuss them. Uh, I think that what's happening in uh, the ups and downs of the process of creating European Union is tremendously important, not only for Italy, not only for Europe as a whole, but for the rest of the world. I mentioned that uh, in our present situation of divorce between power and politics, the uh, power uh, creates the uh, problems which everybody, everywhere in the world, to one extent or another, suffers, are created globally. And I told you that the ways of dealing with them need to be devised and applied locally. Therefore, if you take cities, Trento, to a to greater extent even Rome or Milan and other very big cities in Europe, are uh, performing today double role, double role, very important uh, uh, roles. One, they are dustbins, dustbins for the globally produced problems. They are dropped out there from the, the cyberspace for the local population to deal with. On the other hand, however, that's tremendously important, they serve as unwilling, unknowingly, uh, inadvertently, uh, unanticipatingly functioning laboratories in which the ways of resolving these problems are tried, are designed, are tried, put to the test, rejected, accepted, um, implemented, and so on. Um, migration, diasporization, which I mentioned, is a globally produced problem, but the ways of uh, bringing different populations together, make them uh, into, uh, put them into the condition of what Gallagher called fusion of horizons, peaceful coexistence, uh, dialoguing, uh, learning from each other, liking each other, cooperating with each other, all that is left to the local initiative. And that the same applies to all other globally produced problems. Now, 
Europe is a unique phenomenon. Um, Europe uh, once, uh, once upon a time, not I still remember the time, you can't because you are that uh, several dozens of years younger than I am, but at some point Europe ruled the world, ruled the world. Uh, Britain, where I live, uh, prided, prided itself that uh, it says that uh, sun never sets of, uh, of British Empire, right? It was true. Sun never set on European empires. Europe ruled the world because of its superiority created 300 years before. Superiority military, economic, and also scientific, and but I would say even cultural superiority over the rest of the world. Uh, the Second World War, after the Second World War, people like the Gasperi, Adenauer, uh, Schumann, Bonnet, Spack came together in order to do something about laying foundation for unification of Europe. Unification in one immediate sense. Unified Europe, for them, meant Europe in which the different countries won't go to war with each other. Because it was just after the 30 years long war of Europeans, starting in 1914, ending in 1945. Well, they, uh, uh, why they did it? I suspect, I suspect, I don't have documents, I can't prove it. I suspect that one of the motives behind the initiative was precisely that point. They predicted that the Second World War, which uh, part of Europeans won, all the small part was defeated, will, and will, however, bring to the end the 300 years old European superiority over the, over the world. Bring to the end. Um, that the end of colonial empires, the end of, this, of the unique situation in history when Europe, enjoying its superiority, could find something very luxurious, solutions, namely find global solutions to locally produced problems. If unemployment redundancy human misery, uh, division of society, class war, and so on, was the product of Europe uh, 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 being the only one, the only one part of the globe in which these phenomena were appearing, all the other rest of the, of the earth uh, did not modernize at that time, then all Europe produced massively redundant population, which was a disaster in a certain sense, but on the other hand, it was the unique, unrepeatable, fortunate situation in which these redundant people could be used as expeditionary armies, as a colonizers, uh, go to the lands which seem to a superior Europe and unpopulated and renew their life there. According to uh, 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 calculations, about 50 or 60 million Europeans emigrated to Latin America and to uh, North, North America in order to establish their life there. I, I believe that uh, among those in this room, probably, there is not a single one in whose family, among grandfathers and great-grandfathers, someone did not emigrate to America or, or to Australia or some other place. It was a massive phenomenon, massive phenomenon. It can be repeated in the same form because the um, redundant people are now created uh, uh, in, in the countries unable 
to, and are willing and are needing uh, to send expeditionary forces and establish colonialist uh, administration elsewhere. And above all, because hardly any land is remained, is remaining on the globe in which, uh, in which, uh, which could be considered by others as no man's land, as empty land waiting for cultivation, a virgin land uh, which superior culture should take under its own control. In this situation, I think that people like the Gaspari and others could think, quite rightly so, that the role, important role to be played in Europe, in the world, could not be any longer placed on military superiority, on economic superiority, other centers will be probably leaving Europe behind. What can Europe do is to serve its values, its values, its achievement, its, its, its inventions, its inventions, inventions which, be, which will be needed by the rest of the world more than anything else. And that most important contribution, a dowry, which Europe can offer to the rest of the world is what we are trying to learn in a very hard struggle, suffering many defeats, very often falling into despair, but nevertheless progressing. Living, uh, learn the difficult art to learn uh, to uh, live with difference difference which is not going to be a temporary irritant, which is not going to be something which will tomorrow go away, but difference which will be with us forever. People no longer answering, answering the call to assimilate, accommodate, adapt, and so on. People who want to retain uh, their own identity, People who, at the same time, uh, don't want to uh, uh, want to have their identity recognized and respected by the natives, they replace the migrants coming to you into Europe uh, in 19th, 20th century, who were simply expected to abandon. Uh, their own identity and become exactly like Frenchmen or Germans and, and uh, whoever, the, whoever, whoever other country they came. Now let's say a completely new history you can have in London streets. London has 70 diasporas. 70 diasporas who live there. Diasporas, ethnic, religious, linguistic, uh, historical, uh, cultural, and, and whatever, whatever you like. 70 different, and you have uh, streets in London where you can find along one street a Catholic church, a Protestant church, Anglican church, Lutheran church, Methodist chapel, um, mosque, synagogue, uh, Orthodox Christian church, all of them not uh, like in the book by Huntington about clash of civilization, in big places away from each other, but all of them neighbors in the same street. In the same street. The big question. Strangers are dangerous. Strangers are dangerous. People who uh, are afraid of strangers and feel uneasy, uneasy in their company have their reasons. Because you don't know how a stranger is likely to behave himself. And if they are are branded as strangers forever in a categorical way, then there is very little prospect how the virtual relationship could um, develop without a conflict. The only way of, uh, and only prospect of preventing what Huntington uh, wrote about force coming clash of civilizations, um, is uh, to stop uh, treating, for example, a Muslim uh, as a neighbor, as a Muslim, but as a neighbor. That means evaluate him or her the way you 
evaluate all neighbors. He might be a very helpful person, he might be a, a thief, he might be a very nasty person to live with, he might be an exemplary father of the family, or he must, or he may breed hooligans uh, who destroy the environment. Uh, he may be an exemplary husband, or he may beat his wife and cause uh, uh, around, the, around the confrontations every night and uh, in a, uh, disable you from sleeping. So, to, just to evict, to, 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 to uh, take away from this relationship this categorical aspect, and try to learn living together with differences. Not despite the differences, but even thanks to differences. Thanks to differences that uh, if we are really engaged in neighbor relationship, if we are really engaged in um, a sincere, honest dialogue with each other, then we all learn something new. And perhaps we can find in experience of other people something which we overlooked, and something which you enrich our own assortment of uh, means, of ways of uh, coping with the challenges of life. Now, Europe is in this process. Europe is a huge laboratory, the only one in the world in which this is deliberately practiced. Just this designing of the way of restructuring our uh, urban life, our life in common, in such a way as to enable this to happen. Laboratory of the means of living permanently with difference, without some people exercising ambitions of colonization and some other people being pressed to surrender and abandon what is dear to them. That is what is happening in Europe. It will take time. It will take time. Mind you, the whole 19th century was dedicated to the passage from integration on the level of locality to the integration on the level of nation state. 100 years it took. Our time, our, we don't have yet such a long period in which that to happen. Uh, taking into account that all, every few years new members come to Europe and situation becomes more and more complex. I mentioned before about uh, I mentioned before the double bind under which is every government of every nation state. Europe is in triple bind, a bind, triple bind in a sense. Europe, European Union. On the one hand. It protects the nations of the member states from tremendous pressures which otherwise would come from outside, if not for the armory, for the uh, um, uh, well, protective wall, so to speak, of uh, European institutions. On the other hand, like uh, local governments, it cannot disregard, it cannot not uh, count, uh, record with the pressures of the global markets or global powers and other uh, emerging economic powers in the world and so on. Now, when viewed from um, the uh, national perspective, Europe looks very much as an oppressor when it is acting only as an um, enforced mediator between external pressure and the, uh, the well-being of every single nation of the members of the European Union. These are, this is the sort of the of childish, childish period ailments, troubles, pains. We are on the road, we are moving. Situation is very rapidly changing all around. Situation is underdefined, ambiguous, ambivalent, and therefore in one inviting territory, inviting ground for every willing demagogue to make a political capital out of it, 
the, by uh, arresting the process, making additional difficulties, and so on. But this is the way that's happening. And I can only tell you my personal story. I live in Leeds for 40 years, more than 40 years, in the same house. In the same house, my windows are looking at the street, and this is a street through which children from nearby school go home. Wherever I am uh, in proper hours at home, I look through the window, I see people, uh, children going. You know very well the children, very seldom or other, never go alone. They always go in groups. So I was watching groups for 40 years. 40 years ago when I came to Leeds, the, you couldn't find a single mixed race group going home. There were very clear selection. Some groups were white skinned, some were uh, yellow skinned, some were black skins. Today, in 2013, I can bet, with, if you want, uh, you uh, to find a single group which is not multicolored. Simple children bought all in my vicinity. The vicinity is called West Park, uh, Lawsuit. Uh, know each other from, from their birth. No one is newcomer there. They are there. They are there. Born there, playing the, uh, football together, going to the same school. And they divide, not according to color of skin, but according to the character. Some are nasty, some are hooligans, bullies, some others are very nice children, some are helpful um, in, in fighting the awful teachers, some don't cooperate. So they are normal human criteria which are applied. That is what I call laboratory. And I suggest to you that whether you know it or not, or whether you wish it or not, you are workers in this laboratory. Professore, grazie per il suo ottimismo, ma io vorrei porle una questione che riguarda la crisi di rappresentanza. Cioè lei ha parlato di separazione tra il potere e la politica, ma c'è una separazione anche tra la politica e il popolo che questa politica deve rappresentare. Quindi c'è una difficoltà da parte della politica di ascoltare e di cogliere quelle che sono le aspirazioni della gente, ma ritengo che ci sia anche una difficoltà delle persone o della, del popolo a esprimere un comune sentire per un, per un bene comune. Ecco, questo crea, a mio avviso, difficoltà, no? una, crisi, ecco, una crisi delle istituzioni, ma una crisi anche di modalità di rappresentazione no? della volontà popolare. Allora le domando... La nostra democrazia, secondo lei, è ancora un modello che può tenere cioè, questa difficoltà? Può porre in crisi questo nostro sistema di rappresentanza? Oppure anche attraverso le nuove tecnologie? Penso ad esempio alla nascita di un partito politico in pochi mesi attraverso la rete internet. Ecco, faccio quindi è un esempio per segnalare se anche il modo di rappresentare le istanze della base sia ancora quello che noi abbiamo conosciuto o se il futuro si può presentare in modalità diverse. Grazie. Uh, if I'm allowed, uh, I should speak in English as uh, um, the lecturers did. Um, I, I'd like to, to make a suggestion to the, uh, to the auditory about uh, a new book by Zygmunt Bauman who is, who is going to be published in Italian in February. And uh, um, the, the, the title of the book is uh, Liquid Surveillance. Uh, he wrote uh, this book with uh, the most prominent uh, 
uh, expert of sure. uh, surveillance and the world, David Lyon, a close friend of yeah. his. And uh, uh, from this book... Hey, could you stop for a moment? Could you ask to select a channel for conveying the original speech? I have not hear it. I hear it when I hear it. No, but they don't go I would like to be able to hear yes, if you put the, the, the other the, the sorry it has to go the other way this has to go in the back this has to go in the back or else what? Sorry. yes but doesn't matter no, 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 no it has to go in the, in the back can you try it later said that because he but, but it has to, should, how come the translate, he doesn't pick up English? Not translate, but you still, I ask you, sempre, sempre al microfono? Uh, I ask you to leave original channel, original speech also transmitted by channel. Bene, allora la domanda in italiano eh, prendeva le mosse dall'ultimo libro, uno degli ultimi libri di, di Bauman che uscirà in Italia in febbraio, che, il cui titolo inglese è Liquid Surveillance, scritto con David Lyon. Ecco, da questo libro eh, prenderei le mosse poiché in questo libro Bauman parla, eh, spiega nel dettaglio insieme a Lyon quali sono i meccanismi sottolineati e le strategie e le tecniche che vengono usate prevalentemente dai nuovi imperatori del mondo, ovvero, eh, eh, ovvero il, il potere politico statunitense, che usa i droni e moltissime altre tecniche per sorvegliare, per spiare, usando magari il Banopticon invece che il Panopticon, come avveniva ai tempi di Ventam e come era stato richiamato da Foucault, ovvero per tenere fuori le persone, però anche per bandire intere categorie di persone, molti sono i migranti, eccetera. Tuttavia, in questi giorni noi abbiamo assistito a un evento che potrebbe, eh, io penso sempre in termini di speranza e so che la speranza, benché sia un critico anche feroce di, alcune, di alcuni aspetti tremendi della contemporaneità, la speranza è sempre, è sempre connaturata al pensiero di Bauman. Orbene, in questi giorni noi abbiamo visto che e gli americani spiavano tutti, anche la Merkel si è dovuta arrabbiare, si è dovuta arrabbiare forte e, e, e si sono arrabbiati un po' tutti e allora che cosa è successo? Che e, persone come Robert Redford hanno commentato, ah va bene, e, e, cioè se il povero Obama deve proseguire le politiche di Bush allora e, viene attaccato dai repubblicani che sono razzisti, ma abbiamo visto anche Schmidt per esempio dire ma allora dobbiamo sospendere i trattati, allora noi non dobbiamo permettere, anche Rampini lo ha scritto, di essere trattati come vassalli o come nemici, non vogliamo essere nemici ma non vogliamo neppure essere vassalli. Allora, queste spinte, queste, queste, mh, questi attacchi, questi attacchi così rapaci e così sbilanciati da parte degli Stati Uniti potrebbero contribuire a ricompattare un'Europa che, diciamocelo, è vecchia. Però la vecchiaia a cui molti guardano in termini di rottamazione possibile, infatti è stata una espressione che è stata anche revocata da chi la aveva usata per prima, la vecchiaia è una, è una risorsa eccezionale, l'Europa è vecchia nei termini in cui è saggia, nell'Europa eh, si trovano Proprio perché si sono stratificate nel tempo le intelligenze, la cultura, il sapere, le ricerche di tanti S uomini. Scusi, una, può arrivare alla domanda? Una saggezza, una saggezza che si contrappone a quella prevalente, adesso chiudo subito, a quella prevalente, per esempio, presso gli americani, non so, pensiamo all'ultimo libro di Mark Prensky, dove si parla della tecnologia che ci rende migliori, più saggi. Ora, la saggezza autentica, perché è intrisa di umanità, che è nell'Europa, dovrebbe con il contributo di molte persone offrire forse le risposte per una, per una unione che non sia più solo economico-finanziaria ma che potesse essere oltre che il laboratorio di cui parlava Bauman anche la sede da cui ripartire per poter ricominciare a lavorare insieme Grazie. nella diversità. Grazie.
I don't know if you want that. Uh, there was a first question. Yeah. Uh, your question. Your question about politics and people. I uh, fully agree, and I made uh, references in what I was speaking about to that uh, very, very painful and very, very dangerous issue. L crisis of trust. Crisis of trust in existing political institutions. Crisis of trust, which is not without reasons, which had its causes, which ought to be treated very seriously. Uh, one reason, which I said before, is uh, uh, precisely the fact that politicians, professional politicians, are put in double bind. They don't have one boss to listen to, their nation. They have another boss to listen to. The, the free floating, free floating powers which uh, decide what are the chances that uh, the uh, the well-being, that the decent conditions of life in a given country will persist. Uh, remember how it happened. If you look on history of uh, the world, economic history of the world, starting from 1990 and up to this day, you will see how the collapse of economy of one national country traveled around the world. There was the Argentinian crisis, there was the Mexican crisis, there was the Malaysian crisis, there was the Japanese collapse of yen, there was the Russian collapse of ruble, there was Icelandic collapse, there was Ireland collapse. Now we are going through the collapse of Greece. Italy is threatened constantly with economic collapse and so is uh, so is uh, uh, Spain. The situation is simply like that, that other conditions of a permanent or rather long-lasting divorce between power and politics, um, the, it, is an, it is a situation inviting for all sorts of currency speculants. Currents. It is as if created for the use of currency speculators, the currency speculators in the form of international merchant banks and venture banks and so on, which are free to move from one country to another, ignoring the local boundaries, ignoring the uh, will of the electors of the given government, ignoring the law, laws of the country and so on. Um, they concentrate their focus on one place, on one country which seems to be the, uh, the weakest, the weakest uh, link in the channel, the weakest link in the channel, exploit everything which is possible to exploit, because crisis is not a process of impoverishment. Crisis is a process of redistribution of wealth. So somebody gains, somebody loses. And they decide who is uh, to gain and who is to lose. That's, that will go on and on and on unless there is some, I repeat, global equivalent of the political institutions which our ancestors invented for the service of nation state. We don't have it. And therefore, the major reason of mistrust of people toward their government consists in uh, the rise from their doubt. We doubt whether government is able to do what they promise to do, whether it is able to defend. The uh, manifestation of this mistrust, um, of this lack of communication, government speaks in one language which most people don't understand, and government very little uh, is aware of what is really the daily life, the daily struggle, the daily pursuit of uh, decent life among the ordinary people. Now, uh, this break of communication, a break of communication um, uh, leads to, 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 uh, to, to simulate very many people, to look for alternatives. Uh, the, uh, 
movement of the indignants or this black march on Rome, which happened two or three days ago, right? Or, uh, or um, uh, Occupy Wall Street, starting uh, from uh, Liberation Square in Cairo and, and going to, to Cotti Park in Manhattan, where the occupants of um, um, uh, Wall Street uh, uh, sat. Now, that are manifestations of spontaneous desire to find alternative may, uh, ways of making uh, uh, will, popular will, efficient, effective, because the government is no longer considered as the instrument to make the popular will effective, it's unable to do so for, for obvious reasons. However, these movements, looking for alternative ways of doing things effective, are also parts of laboratory. They are experiments. And if you want to know my view, my view, and unfortunately a firm view at the moment, is that none of these experiments uh, just proved that, that, that the alternative has been found. None. None of them. On the contrary, what we see is what I call the explosive solidarity. People come to one place, just guided, just pulled, pushed by their common desire to make things better because they can't stand them as they are. They forget about differences of interest between them for the time of staying on Tahrir Square or in Tukotti Park. Uh, but, uh, you know, after a while they go home and then they are facing their ordinary daily life, ordinary routine, ordinary conflict of interest, ordinary fears, ordinary suspicions, and so on and so on. It all falls apart. Uh, that uh, Wall Street was occupied, all televisions of the world noticed. All newspapers of the world notice. The only place where occupation had not been noticed was the Wall Street. It didn't notice that it was occupied. And it goes on as if nothing ever happened. Nothing was left out of it. Uh, we had um, Arab Spring. Do you remember still Arab Spring, right? We were waiting two years or so for Arab summer, it never arrived. And uh, then immediately Arab uh, winter came right away. Now that is how it, it doesn't work for the time being. Perhaps uh, some other way will be uh, invented. Perhaps this particular way will be improved, perfected or whatever deprived of its shortcomings, I don't know, I much profit. But looking around and start, starting, st trying to diagnose the state of affairs, I can only tell you that uh, so far we are uh, groping in the dark, looking for replacement for our instit political institutions, which are not working properly. Therefore, in the foreseeable future, I think that mistrust of existing political institutions will continue, the break of communication will continue, and so we attempt to find solutions. Whether they will be successful and how soon, I cannot tell you, being a humble sociologist and not a prophet. Professor Bauman used the very nice analogy that we are all workers in a laboratory. Uh, I think you've given us very much tonight to work in this laboratory for lots of experiment. Um, we hope over the next few months to, uh, to add more 
uh, so uh, to uh, um, our laboratory here in Trento, uh, taking inspiration from the 22 ideas uh, to fix the world. Uh, I'd like to thank our panelists tonight. Uh, a, s a very special thanks to Professor Bauman uh, for for coming here and for sharing um, his his ideas about laboratories and experiments. E grazie a voi per la vostra partecipazione. Um, e alla prossima. Grazie. Thank you.